Hello. I think we'll get started in two minutes. So if we could get the panelists on stage and other participants in the room, please. Hello everyone and um, welcome to this uh, highly uh, relevant panel on data-driven uh, business uh, models. I will not make a long introduction because we've already lost a lot of time. This panel has gone from 60 to 50 to now 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, no, fortunately, there's not been a reduction in the number of panelists. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're still nine panelists with, uh, with about uh, 40 minutes uh, to share. Uh, we all know the importance of the subject. I'm not going to go on about that. Uh, data really is the, uh, the oil of this uh, century. But we have a lot of questions that we need to discuss. How are we going to leverage data? How are we going to measure the value of data? Uh, data is not homogenous. There is personal and non-personal data. There's public, non-public data. There's user and machine-derived uh, data. So we need to discuss uh, how we're going to uh, leverage uh, data uh, in, uh, in, in the future. We've done uh, a lot of work in the OECD and embarking on new work on now to, uh, how to enhance access uh, to data. That is why we take a particular interest uh, as part of our going uh, digital project, which is the biggest horizontal project uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the OECD. Uh, it's going to work this way. I'm going to give all of nine of our panelists the floor to say whatever they want about the subject. I'm not sure we're going to have time for a Q&A. We will try to see if we can. Um, I have a, a, a method to discipline you uh, that the public doesn't know about, but there is a watch here to limit you to the three minutes. I can see it, you can see it, but you can't see it, but, but that, that is meant to discipline us. So you all have three minutes, uh, except uh, you, uh, uh, Martin, you will kick us off. Uh, you have uh, five uh, minutes. Um, Martin is the... Uh, uh, Martin is the founder of Bolt and also an entrepreneur for 20 years. You've started uh, six uh, companies and you're also the co-founder of the Estonian Education Foundation. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, hello. Uh, great to be here today. Um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll try to give a quick overview of how we see uh, urban transportation and how data is, is relevant to, to our business model. So then... Um, Bolt uh, is the uh, third fastest growing company in Europe based on uh, Financial Times. Uh, we operate in 34 markets. We operate ride hailing, uh, micro mobility, electric scooters, uh, motorcycle taxis, and now recently also food delivery. And uh, yeah, we have been growing really fast. We are a six year old company and one of the European challengers and unicorns. Um, then, uh, um, how much we actually use uh, and then gather data. So we do about 1 million rides per day. So that means that we get hundreds of gigabytes of valuable data all the time. And when talking about AI, then we currently have 300 AI models in production uh, currently. And that's not just developing the models, but that also means that uh, we need to monitor them to make sure that uh, they make sense, they add value, and so on. Um, then, uh, what are the use cases where we actually use data and, and also uh, data science and, and machine learning? So, uh, as in ride hailing, uh, you probably know that pricing is really important. So, passengers always want a cheaper price, the drivers always want to have higher price. How do we find a reasonable balance in between them to make sure that we have enough drivers to cover the, the need? and the price is uh, cheap enough so that drivers would be willing to come out. So this is one of the, the main things. We, we use data and try to predict um, what kind of pricing logic we should, we should provide. 
Second is about campaigns. So, uh, for example, recently we, we launched in London and uh, we, uh, we invested millions per month. So how we make sure that all the campaign uh, money is exactly targeted to people that, uh, that we get the best return out of it. So uh, we need to subsidize drivers to bring them online. We need to give discounts to passengers how exactly what patterns is, is needed to, to get the best results. So this is what we do in pricing side. Uh, then uh, maps and ETAs, you probably all of know that ETA of, of these apps are, are challenging. Sometimes they go wrong because the city traffic is very difficult to predict. So we have now last two years built the mapping layer in-house. Before that, we were, we were based on Google Maps, but now we also use OpenStreetMaps. We use our own data from the rights, and we try to calculate the best possible ETA to make sure that uh, we can tell you when the car actually arrives. So th those are maybe the three main areas where we where we use um, use data data science. Um, a few principles: that we always want to be ethical, so we don't want to use uh, data. For example, we know that the passenger is ordering a car; they have an expensive latest iPhone model, and their battery is about to die. Quite a good uh, situation where to put high prices, but we don't want to do that, and all our uh, majority of our AI decisions are actually based on aggregated data, not about single person. Few example or few exceptions here is when we need to deal with fraud prevention or uh, some law enforcement situations, then we actually need to uh, consider specific users. And of course, we need to take very much care about the data. Everyone's accessing private data is logged and, and only per need basis. And uh, then lately, we have lots of regulations coming up, uh, GDPR, uh, but also uh, the AI ethics and, and different frameworks that we are, we are monitoring on. So we try to always follow the regulations and best practices. And uh, then what challenges we, we see ahead? So um, for our case, um, operating in cities, then many and more and more cities are asking data from the platforms. So, so the challenge for us is that uh, APIs are very different, the data, how they ask it, what they ask is very different, so we would be happy if there would be some kind of best practice globally, so we could have one API and share it with all. But on the second, the challenge is what data to share, because data is also a competitive advantage for platforms, and uh, cities often ask too much data, which they might even not use, so we, we need to find a very balanced situation, what to share in order not to lose competitive advantage, but on the other hand, then gain um, data that cities need for planning their transport and so on. And secondly, we see that uh, overall global data literacy level for people is relevantly low. We have all these sophisticated discussions about AI, the data and so on, but most people don't even understand that. So we need to raise and educate people. And there is a one very good Finnish initiatives. It's a free online course, 15 hours elements of AI. And Finland claims that 2% of their population have already passed it. I think that many other nations could take that lead and then try to educate their people so we actually have relevant and, and reasonable discussions. And finally, I mentioned already regulations. That's a challenge everywhere. So how to find a, a decent balance for that. So um, thank you. That was very shortly from Bolt. And uh, by the way, all our rides in Europe are carbon neutral. So we also try to be a sustainable platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And you even did it in four minutes. That shows you the efficiency of the private sector. So you saved us one minute. I, I'd like to now turn to uh, you, Dr. Uh, Dirk uh, Abendroth. Uh, you uh, are uh, you're the chief technology officer of uh, Continental uh, Automotive and also an award-winning expert in the development of systems for automated driving, connected mobility, and electric uh, vehicle drivers. Uh, Dirk, you have the floor. Yeah, just reflecting on a couple of um, critical principles we uh, think are the key ones to finally make business happen and make us feel comfortable with this. Um, I think one of the key things, first of all, is that we um, agree upon a uh, underlying principle, which is very simply speaking, Joe Kaiser mentioned that earlier in his keynote, uh, we are under control of our data. That applies to us as human beings, our personal data, on the one inside, and secondly, as he mentioned as well, uh, to IP. So IP is to a certain degree data as well, and it's something we need to be under control. Otherwise, no business is possible, as you mentioned earlier. So that is kind of the 
to my understanding, underlying principle, otherwise it can't work. Once this is uh, in place and you are under control of your data, then the second step is very kind of straightforward. Then it needs trust to give your data to somebody else. So and this trust is something you need to earn one by one or you need to have at least some of an initial trust and then see this trust is proven to, to be right. So in the end, it needs kind of very clear kind of regulations in the sense like, how do I, for example, give away my IP and get recharged back? How can I have control of my personal data and make sure it is not kind of you know, misused, etc.? So these are kind of the two steps which are kind of, I think, straightforward. When it comes to the very special and, and, and dedicated business uh, I'm in automotive uh, and mobility, then I think there's um, three uh, say basic notions I'd like to mention here. One is um, classification. So to us, it's very, very important what kind of data we're looking at. Just give you um, kind of a couple of examples. One is, for example, you just collect traces. Or another thing might be you ask people and the quality, say the, the quality and the kind of, of what you get back, the samples are totally different. That, which is kind of related to the second aspect, which is what I call qualification. So qualification is something like, well, you could simply kind of translate that to quality. What's the quality of data I get? So for example, is it a re representative sample? Is it something which represents the European Union or African people or the entire world or just a city or whatever? Is there a rep representative uh, sample? Or is it maybe something which even qualifies, for example, to get a certain homologation? For, for example, to get something proven to be safety uh, relevant or even safe? So these kind of, for example, traces, once they are kind of you know, harmonized and have been proven by an official uh, institute or government, could be very helpful for us. So another example for qualification of data. Well, the very last one, obviously, mentioned by, I guess, uh, very many people today already, um, by Mr. Kees and Mr. Altman, uh, Altmaier as well, is obviously uh, cybersecurity. Uh, you and I know uh, it's very uh, easy to manipulate data as well as software, so that is one of the crucial parts we need to definitely take care of as well. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Arbenroth. Um very interesting. I'd now like to uh, introduce, uh, and we're going to jump ahead a little bit in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the queue here, I'd like to introduce uh, Karina Röllig. Uh, you are the founder and CEO of Web Data Solutions, uh, which is now, I think, one of the fastest uh, growing uh, German startups, and also has uh, just recently released the market analysis uh, software Blackbee. Karina, you have the floor. Yeah, that's correct. Thanks for the introduction. So, we are a spin-off of the University of Leipzig and it's all about data, what we are doing. So we, we collect um, online, um, globally, data about um, prices and product offers from um, online marketplaces and um, retailers. And uh, for us, it's, it's really relevant um, what, what we are allowed to do with. So uh, first of all, for us, um, all the regulations uh, with the internet, all things that um, doesn't allow us to, to extract um, product information um, from the web, like images or um, data descriptions, product descriptions. This is uh, everything what, what maybe could um, bring us in, in trouble with our business model. So for us, it would be very, very relevant um, to get the same regulations um, as you maybe have in the US or in other States in the world, so there are huge differences um, if you compare this um, with the German law. This is maybe point first. Um, so on the other hand, so as, as we are extracting all these heterogeneous data from global web sources, um, we have a very um, high focus on data quality. So data quality in the end is really key. And uh, what we see that um, even huge companies um, are sometimes struggling with data quality, even with their internal data. So if we bring data together to make analyzes, to realize maybe in the end um, artificial in intelligence solutions, so we need to make sure that we can trust on the data we get and uh, that our clients in the end can also rely on these data. And uh, what we also see is uh, what data is stored in different um, resources or platforms or databases. And um, 
to, to realize um, global um, data-driven businesses, you need to bring all this data together, normalize it and enhance it maybe with more relevant information and to make sure that it's always um, available and uh, that's directly usable. Um, and um, yeah, for, for us, um, the, the main point um, uh, with the internet is, is, is on, on, on the other hand, this is really, really a huge um, opportunity to use the data there and um, to make it useful and to, to bring it in the end to, to solutions which can help um, people. Maybe yeah, in our kind it's an, an easy kind to make in the end um, good decisions how to um, set your own prices in maybe your own um, store, but it could also help to um, realize which products are maybe sustainable or not. So there are lots of um, more business cases behind these data we are collecting today. And yeah, I really hope that um, we, we, we can um, create a world where data is available and it is useful for everyone in the end. Thank you so much. That was short and sweet and, and, and to the point. Um, I now turn to uh, Henri Vadier, who is the French ambassador for digital affairs, uh, one of, us, I think, seven uh, thematic ambassadors in the French uh, Foreign Service. You're also a former entrepreneur, a digital specialist with experience across the private and public sector. And I, I just noticed that I, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. Uh, and I, and I, I think the, the easy way to do it is by saying that when, when Henri and I met earlier today uh, and we talked about some, some negotiations we, we were both involved in, he said, well, I've been a tech guy all my life. I've only done this diplomatic stuff for a year. And I said to Henri, but, but for me, it's the, exactly the opposite. I've been a diplomat all my life. I've only done this tech stuff for a year. Uh, so I was also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, li uh, like you are now, in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 25 years before taking up these positions as, as a Deputy Secretary General. Uh, enough about me. Uh, Henri, you have the floor. Thank you for five minutes, uh, four minutes. And I will leave after, before the end of the conference. So good morning. But not before the end of the four minutes, I hope. <laughs> so. Good morning, I'm very happy to share some ideas with you. I, yes, I was also the first chief data officer of the French government, and I share four ideas. The main idea is that we have to face the fact that, th think about this, through history, the main, the greatest disruption have occurred when a scarce resource became abundant. It was a case for food and agriculture, for printing and knowledge, for uh, industrial revolution and energy, and now we have to face the fourth one, it's the data abundance. And we are not prepared to this. Because when we have this kind of revolution, everything changes. The balance of powers change, the value chain change, and the public policies and the role of the state change. And this revolution is not like the former revolution because there is a great difference. It's not, the data is not the new oil. I disagree with your introduction. Because data is an infinite resource. You can use the data and you create more data, not less data. So we have to deal with the uh, abundance revolution with an infinite resource. And that's something very new in human history. And uh, your question this morning is how to create more value in this field. So first, the first answer is quite simple. Uh, we create value when someone uses the data to build something. That's quite simple. And there is a first consequence, is that very often, maybe not every time, but very often, you should share your data, make open government data for governments and share your data, because if you don't, the people will find the data elsewhere and we will organize themselves without you and without your data, and you will be weak and alone uh, somewhere. So, it's not so difficult. If some people use the data, they may create value. Uh, the, the question for government is more where do we create value and for whom? And of course, as government, I think that we have to promote the creation of shared value and to fight for general interest. And for this, maybe it was your question, we will need some regulation sometimes, but I feel that we need more uh, public policies. And we need three very important topics in these public policies, and I, I will be brief. First, we, we need to foster innovation. Because this kind of innovation comes from rich ecosystem with uh, collaboration, creativity, interaction, fair competition. We need research, we need uh, experimentation, we need to be able to create a lot of startups. So we have to foster innovation. 
Then, and that's very important, we need to build robust data infrastructures. We spend a lot of money as government for roads, rail, and a lot of physical infrastructures, and we don't consider enough the data infrastructures. So sometimes we will have to finance and build the infrastructures, but in this field, sometimes it's more efficient to, to cooperate with commons, with OpenStreetMap, with uh, Wikipedia, with, uh, because you, the people, you, you are building very interesting in infrastructures, and the, that has, uh, digital commons, that's very important. And of course, uh, last but not least, we need to build trust and accountability into everything we do with data. Most people ha have concern around the misuse of data to oppress and control individuals. They, they have concern with huge monopolies. They have concern with privacy. They are right. You have to face this. You, you have to organize ourselves to avoid this kind of uh, threat with data. So uh, the citizen has the right to have these concerns, and the government has a duty to find solution with you. But uh, that's my three topics, innovation, infrastructures, and uh, trust and accountability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd now like to turn to uh, uh, Grégoire uh, Kopp. Uh, you are the chief of staff at uh, OVH. Uh, you have a varied background as a former director of communication and spokesperson for Uber France. Uh, and you're also a previous uh, ministerial advisor in the Ministry of Transport. And you also uh, did some time as a lawyer, lobbyist, uh, protecting uh, consumer interests. Uh, Grégoire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to talk today because, as you said, it's really important to have some room, some area to discuss between diplomats, between entrepreneurs, between politicians, because we need to create internet together. OVH Cloud, it's a cloud company, it's the biggest one in Europe. We are the only European one in the top 10 worldwide. And we were built 20 years ago in France by Octave Claba, a Polish uh, immigrant. So we are European by design. We created the European scale during 10 years between 2000 and 2010. And we did that with very special values because Octave Claba, the founder, is a real tech guy. So for him, open source. Sharing data, it's very important. And all the commitment of the company is based on that. First of all, the motto of the company since the beginning was innovation is freedom. Because for Octav, it was just natural that innovation can just create freedom. But we discovered and realized a few years ago that it was not always the case. And we changed our motto for innovation for freedom, because we need a very special commitment for that. Uh, to answer the question on how we can build a more trustful internet based on data, I think there's just two main points. The first one is reversibility. We need to be able to exchange data. And to do that, we need to create some way to work together now, in Europe, there is a special initiative based on the German government called Gaia-X, and we will work on that because we need to create some links between all companies, and we, we need to be able to host data everywhere to share it with all transparency. And we need to push on standardization too. So my, it's my second point, standard, standardization, because we need to be able to discuss together. It's like to not be able to talk together. And internet is a common thing, so two things, reversibility and standardization. Thank you so much, Gregor. That was short and sweet as well, very much uh, to the point. And, 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 and you actually uh, uh, asked, uh, recommended that we could have more dialogue between the private sector, the multi-stakeholder community and, uh, and uh, ministers. And we actually do have a minister also on the panel, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. So I'd like to introduce uh, Minister Johnny G. Uh, Plate, who's a Minister of Communication and Information in uh, Indonesia. Uh, your portfolio uh, covers uh, many of the main themes of uh, this forum, actually, uh, both uh, cybercrime, data sovereignty, and also information technology. We're very pleased to have you with us, uh, Minister. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Eric. As you just mentioned, I, I, w I was sworn in a month ago, and I have to deal with all this uh, <laughs> informatics. I'm talking about Indonesia only now. As Indonesia aim to become a digital nation, a great emphasis is being placed on improving connectivity across the archipelago through infrastructure, fiber optics, BDS, satellites that connect people from Aceh in the west to Papua in the east. It took 75 years for telephone to reach 100 million users worldwide. But it took Pokemon Go only less than a month to reach the same number 
rapid adoption of new innovations and technology has been a key consequence of unprecedented cross-border data flows. Data flows have made our country safer, more efficient, and productive. Indonesia enabling of interest access to its entire population lead us to inevitable data governance challenges. As more than 150 million Indonesians now have access to the internet, Indonesia is drawing on a multi-stakeholder approach towards protecting our citizens' data. This approach involves ministries, the national police, tech and telco companies, and civil society. I'll, I will clarify the roles and responsibility of stakeholders with two examples. First, our government will soon complete the general data protection regulations, which is currently being discussed in parliament. These new data regula protection regulations will not only acknowledge data privacy as a basic right of every citizen, it will also guarantee protection of, of consumers' data. Second, Indonesia has launched the largest digital literacy movement in Southeast Asia. The National Movement on Digital Literacy, also named Cybercreasi, is a multi-stakeholder grassroots movement. This movement is made up of businesses, communities, government entities, and academics to engage with and empower communities in data protection, digital literacy, develop curricula, and govern cyberspace. It is taking concerted actions against hoaxes, fake news, and cyberbullying that have become rampant. The two examples il illustrate the key roles of the regulator and regulated. On the one hand, our regulations are giving legal weight to the importance of all stakeholders or to give up to protecting personal data. On the other hand, every citizen must be aware that data privacy is a basic right he or she enjoys. This can only be achieved through strengthening digital literacy. The roles and responsibilities within the multi-stakeholders community are therefore clear. In my view, government institutions must act to protect citizens at all costs, and that includes data. Civil society must educate itself and be educated in schools on data privacy, data privacy rights. The public and the private sectors may collect data, but must do so in accordance with the law. And we are just witnessing the early stages of artificial intelligence, big data, and the Internet of Things. Future innovations will revolutionize daily life as we know it. But only if we follow these principles can we ensure that data protection will be upheld in the wake of new innovations and technologies. We have a long way ahead in answering our long-term digital competitiveness and optimizing our data governance framework. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Uh, next in line is uh, Theresa Swinehart, uh, the uh, Senior Vice President of uh, Multi-Stakeholder Strategy and Strategic Initiatives at ICANN. Uh, and uh, you're also a leading uh, advocate of an open and secure internet, and of course uh, an expert uh, in global internet governance and uh, cooperation. Please. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you very much for having ICANN here. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity. We're one of the many players in the internet space and in the internet ecosystem, and you might ask why we're here on this panel on this topic. Um, it's really about trying to retain an opal, open, stable, secure, interoperable internet. We deal with the coordination of the unique identifier system, the addressing space, IP <laughs> protocol, domain names, um, and IP addressing. And that's really uh, the mechanism on which the platforms run. And so this conversation is very important because there's dependencies between frameworks being looked at around data and frameworks that impact the underlying infrastructure of the internet more generally. So I was really struck by one piece of information that was shared with me in preparing for this. It took 38 years for the radio to reach a market of 50 million users. It took 13 years for the television to reach that same market. But for the internet, it was only four years. And I, I think that really goes to some of the earlier points about the 
the rapid pace of the evolution, but also the cognizant nature of having all players at the table in discussing frameworks that need to be addressed uh, around data and around the, the future regulation or best practices for the internet space. So if we look at the ecosystem more broadly, we heard some other terms earlier around the importance of the trust in the internet, how it works, the security, the stability. And for that, you really need to bring all the players together to have that conversation. There's no single stakeholder. So I think having a panel like this is really quite critical. From our standpoint, it's really informing the discussions that are occurring, the technical nature of the discussions, the potential for unintended consequences around that. And if I can bring one story closer to home for us has been the re recent discussions around uh, the data protection legislation uh, and the GDPR. A well, well-intended legislation and a well-intended effort. Uh, the unintended consequences, though, around that have been seen in areas that are part of the underlying coordination of the infrastructure space and of the domain name space. And so when we talk about what kind of frameworks or regimes are needed, it's really ones that bring all parties together to the table, figure out solutions that are scalable, but also solutions that don't have an unintended consequence for the future of the internet and the benefits that lie ahead. So to put that into context for this panel, thank you. Thank you so much also for your brevity. Um, uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Leonid uh, Todorov. Uh, you're the general manager of the Asia-Pacific Top Level Domain Association. You also uh, served uh, previously as chief of state to the late Russian PM, uh, uh, Yegor Gaidar, and you've also been involved in the creation of the Russian Internet Governance uh, Forum. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll be uh, short. Uh, well, first of all, I represent a huge community of 64 uh, organizations that run uh, national country code top-level domains like DE for Germany or FR for France, but across Asia-Pacific. And as, as you would imagine, the region is huge and uh, so uh, is the diversity uh, uh, within the region uh, because we have huge countries like China or India and very small ones like, for example, a small Pacific island of Niue with just 1,500 uh, residents. Uh, with that, I must say that we face uh, probably uh, the same uh, challenges as uh, anybody else because we live on data. Uh, uh, let's say in contrast to Uber, we don't have any physical infrastructure, but some uh, of our members operate name servers, which is hardware. But in effect, we run registries, which are uh, lists of uh, people or organizations that register domain names which is understandable. And 70% of our members are governments, which is also interesting because uh, then it means that governments are coming to the forefront uh, uh, of uh, the problem. With that, I must say that by and large, my empirical uh, sense is that across the region, there is uh, a huge lack of awareness of uh, the value of data. For example, if you talk to people in certain countries like China, uh, probably you won't be able to make them appreciate the value of uh, data, of personal data, and that they would not be on the same page with you. So uh, that means that uh, for some of our members, quite many of them, uh, data collection and data storage and use uh, is not are not uh, specified in any SLA service level uh, agreements. So and uh, they are mo by and large are left uh, to uh, navigate uh, the way of their own. And remember that no GDPR across uh, uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, there is not that level of. Uh, concerned about uh, the usage of uh, the data. Uh, with that, I must say that as any CCTLD, country code top level domain operator, uh, our members face the same processes, very adverse processes, uh, because governments are really keen to take on this subject. And uh, those are brilliantly put, brilliantly put by uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle. Uh, three things which really concern us. First of all, uh, in reacting sometimes irrationally to the challenge, governments are uh, trying uh, 
hyper jurisdiction, which means that they focus on uh, jurisdictional issues. Secondly, legal plurality. You would imagine how many laws are adopted across the region and worldwide. And thirdly, legal arms race. And uh, we are in the epicenter of that legal arms race, although we operate in each and every uh, jurisdiction across the region. So uh, the uh, uh, remedy is simple, it seems to me, and that is uh, education and awareness raising. UN put it uh, 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 in one of their uh, documents back in 2003, and I see no other remedy, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, we have uh, saved the, the best for last, so I now turn to uh, Monika Wiederholt, uh, Executive Vice President of Airlines Central and Eastern Europe, Amadeus IT Group, but also Chairwoman, or perhaps more importantly, Chairwoman of, uh, of the Managing Board of uh, Amadeus uh, Germany. Uh, Monika, do you want to finish us off? With pleasure, thank you. So um, Amadeus is the leading travel tech company, and as you mentioned, uh, that Half of all the airline passengers supported worldwide flow through our system. That means we are dealing with a lot of transactional and private data. And I think uh, what we are trying to reach here collectively is really organizing the digital world of the future. And uh, that is just amazing in its, the task in itself. Yeah. So what we see is that we have to organize both sides, the data owner side and the data user side. The data owner might be a citizen, a person, a traveler, might be an organization, a company, or government. Both needs, actually, we think, are quite similar. You need to have trust. You want to know what to do with the data, so the owner should be in control of the data. We think that is most important. Be it an individual person, to, to privacy reason, maybe. Be it an organization, more to intellectual property reasons. But the control of the owner of the data is key. Yeah. On the user side, on the other side, uh, we see that the accessibility and the manageability of data is very important and um, this is quite difficult and we heard it earlier in the keynotes that even for smaller, for smaller companies, medium-sized companies, this is really an issue. So what I would like to do to finish is uh, with two examples what we do as a company to address both sides or big pro projects going on, on the owner side and the user side. On the owner side, I would say the, um, in travel, the most burning problem, one of our biggest projects right now, is really trying to create interoperable, interoperable digital identities. This is something in the new digital world of travel, which is so important for the travel, and it's so difficult to solve because we have all these different uh, national interests, uh, legal environments, etc. So how can we collectively create and incorporate and secure these digital identities of our citizens, of our travelers in the future? And you really think through, close your eyes and dream of this travel of the future. It will be quite different. You, know, you won't queue up at hotel desks, you won't queue up in airports. The travel of today is a really difficult journey and it will be different tomorrow. And digital identity is key to do so. And on the other side, on the usability side, what we do as a company, but, but I think a lot of companies do, is really open up our data. Not the individual ones, of course, but the aggregated ones, the artificial intelligence skills we have, open it up and provide an environment for developers to access it. So even as an individual person, as a startup, you could use these massive data and, and the massive skills behind to create innovation and businesses on top. Uh, but that is to close. Both sides have to be managed. And maybe the last wish I have is really whatever policies we create, uh, we have to create a practical, manageable output for users and for owners. Thank you so much. I think we were, we were uh, due to the lateness of, uh, of the, the proceedings this morning, we were given one minute extra. Uh, ten minutes extra, sorry. It's, uh, it's only nine past one. So there is actually one minute available if any one of the panelists thought there was something that they wanted to react to that others had said. Um, anyone? Perhaps especially, I'm looking at Gregoire, Theresa and Karina, who were particularly brief in their comments. So if you want to, to, to spend a minute with us, please feel free if you have anything. Yeah, maybe one addition. Mm -hmm. um, so as we are spin-off um, from university, so research was always a huge topic for us. 
And if I remember the times where our or my research colleagues tried to um, develop um, something really, really great new stuff, we were always lacking on data. So we, we take too much time to get data, to get access to data. And I would say if we can sol solve this problem, um, all of these research will be done much more efficient and much better. That's maybe the last I would say to this discussion. And I would like to add that there is possibility to do something very concrete. For example, tomorrow we will share with the European Commission the release of the first code of conduct for YAS, Infrastructure as a Service, about reversibility. And it's very concrete engagement that we will be able to promote and to show because we create a group of a working group with many companies, civil society, to get that type of code of conduct. And it's very concrete. It will be engaged in the European uh, area. And we should work on that because we should avoid vendor locking about uh, data is very important. Because if you can't take off your data, if you can't move, if you are stuck somewhere, it's finished for you. So it's really important to do that too. OK, with that, I would like to thank uh, all of you. Uh, it's been a very, very stimulating discussion. I, I, I won't try to summarize this because it's been such a diverse discussion. I put down here digital literacy, awareness, education, standardization, trust, innovation, even freedom, cybersecurity, even cyberbullying. Uh, so you were very disciplined in terms of keeping the time, uh, but it's difficult to be disciplined when it comes to con containing this issue because it really is so diverse. And maybe, maybe that leads to, to two more procedural conclusions. One is that I think it shows the importance of really having this dialogue, as many of you also pointed to, between the political level, business level, private sector, academia and, and civil society. This really has to be a multi-stakeholder uh, endeavor if we are to succeed. And then perhaps secondly, also to move from, from the conceptual or abstract to the more concise and, and, and concrete. That's easier said than done, but I think I, I felt a common uh, wish that we can move in uh, that uh, direction. Uh, just uh, 20 seconds on what we do at the OECD. We will continue with our going digital work. We provide country reviews to, to, to provide targeted uh, uh, policy recommendation for countries. We also have a, a going digital toolkit where we try to assemble best practices when when governments and others confront uh, uh, difficult policy questions. So we promise that we, will, we have listened today and we will continue to stay engaged. We will continue with phase two of our going digital uh, project. And is there a brief... Um, Brief, brief comment. I hope it's to praise the OECD because otherwise I won't allow it. Well, actually, it, it, it was supposed That's to be. That's what I thought. <laughs> All right. Can I? Yeah, sure, of course. All please. right. So I think that OECD is best placed, actually, to a best position to, to do the, the work like this because in the past, you've created amazing alliances and a great dynamic because people, actually, not only people, but governments, were keen to follow the best practices in whatever area. We can uh, uh, mention whatever conventions, right? And uh, they, are, they do so voluntarily in, in that proper understanding that they are joining a club of leading nations uh, that uh, are in pursuit of uh, you know, prosperity and happiness for the mankind. Sorry to say that. But seriously, that's a great job. And I think that uh, you should just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just improved my talking points uh, to a level that uh, was unimaginable. And I promised that this was uh, improvised and we have not provided fees to any of the panelists. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, I have never encountered such a disciplined group of uh, interesting uh, panelists. So thank you very much for your uh, insights. I'm sorry for the, for the delays. I think we got some a very rich discussion uh, nonetheless. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to you. Should we give the, the panelists a, a round of applause? <laughs>